Okay, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, you are welcome to join us by turning on your cameras if you like, which we always like to encourage to create a little bit more of a actual seminar of people format. It's especially useful to the speaker to present to a sea of faces instead of a sea of names. And it's good to have you all. Jerry, it's very good to see you. I think you registered first out of the hundred and something people who registered today. So we're so excited to have you. Uh, thank you for coming along so quickly and we look forward to engaging in the discussion today. I would like to wish everyone from our very Irish Pidgeot a happy St. Patrick's week, which is the way we celebrate it at Pidgeot. I didn't get to do anything with a lot of people on the actual day. So today I am wearing my green jacket that I inherited from my father, which says, the friends, the friendly sons of St. Patrick right on it. So I'm an honorary member of whatever that is. <laughs> but welcome everyone. And uh, you know, for those, of, for those of you that are in Europe, I do encourage you in the reception period that will follow our event to break out your pint of Guinness and celebrate the week properly. Um, it is a joy and a privilege to invite back to us today, uh, Martin Sinflemen, and who has um, treated us to a book. So he is on his book tour. So this is actually the second time we've got to hear from him uh, this year. And we're very excited to have him uh, to celebrate the occasion of the publication of his new book, The Copyright Trademark Interface, How the Expansion of Trademark Protection is Stifling Cultural Creativity. Uh, Martin is a professor of intellectual property law and director of the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. His activity focus on the reconciliation of private intellectual property rights, property rights with competing public interests of social, cultural, or economic nature He's a member of the Copyright Advisory Committee of the Dutch State. He's the president of the European Copyright Society and president of the Trademark Law Institute, among other leadership positions in the field. Perhaps most importantly for us, Martin is a founding member of the Global Expert Network on Copyright User Rights, which PIGIP and EFIR launched in 2011 to study issues like the one at hand. How to promote and protect the utility of copyright user rights in law and policy, including, as we'll discuss here, from trademark law. Let me um, just begin uh, by serving a small number of ground rules that we'd like to follow before turning uh, to Martin. The first, as I mentioned, is this is a seminar uh, with everyone in the same room, and we encourage you, uh, if you feel comfortable, to leave your cameras on uh, to help us feel part of a single group and to give the audience, uh, to give the speaker an audience. Second, um, we record all of these events. So this is your notice of that um, during the public part of the lecture, which is the first 90 minutes. So that uh, takes us to about 1130 Eastern time, uh, EDT. And um, we can, and so this is a, a public record. We keep the archive of all of these videos, which you can find from our past lectures at pidgip.org. And you just follow the events tab. And all of these events are Creative Commons licensed for reuse, including in, for instance, classrooms for those of you who are teachers. So please feel free to use them in your materials. I want to um, encourage everyone to feel very free to use the chat function, including during the speaker's talk, uh, primarily to communicate to others. But to prevent the speaker from being distracted, we tell Martin to not follow the chat. So if you have a particular direct question for Martin, then please raise it during the discussion session. I will uh, follow the chat and try to include um, questions and themes being discussed there into our conversation. But, but if you have a direct question for Martin himself, 
um, we will have a, a discussion period where you can raise that at the end. So Martin will speak for roughly 30 minutes, but we don't have a tight time limit and we won't cut him off. Um, and the rest of our time will be uh, in open discussion. Um, our own Christine Farley, who leads our trademark program, will begin that discussion. And then everyone else is very much encouraged to join in with comments and questions. We'll keep a cue by using the raised hands function, which you can find um, down at the bottom of the screen. It's, it's now located in the reactions button at the bottom of Zoom. So for repeat players, that location has actually shifted a little bit. Um, so after about 90 minutes from our start, so that would be at 11.30 Eastern Daylight Time, we'll close the formal meeting, we'll turn off the camera, but we'll keep this room open in an informal discussion uh, for the next 30 minutes. So that part of the discussion, we operate under Chatham House rule, which means that none of the comments or the questions in that session may be attributed to any speaker. And we do that um, in part because for some participants, this is a more welcoming rule for discussion, um, but we also very much welcome informal um, chatting with colleagues. So feel free to bring on your pets and your babies and, and show with what you have. So if you have any other particular questions for me about the operation of this event, please feel free to direct message me um, in, the, in the chat function. And with that, Martin, you are very, very welcome. Congratulations on the fantastic book and please tell us more about it. So the you should be able to share your screen if you like. Um, and so we're over to you now. Thank you for coming. Yeah, well, um, thank you so much for uh, the, the kind introduction and the congrats, um, Sean. It's, it's great to see so many colleagues and friends uh, joining this um, book talk. Um, Actually, for me personally, of course, it's it's one of my favorite topics at the moment, but it's also a bit of a challenge because um, so, so this is the book and you see it's yeah, it's really I mean, if, if you don't want to read all of it, you can use it as a yoga block or something. So, um, I mean, it's it's quite a lengthy story, I must say, um, but uh, during the uh, book launch uh, last week, one of the comments was that it's an academic page turner. So it seems that um, it's quite a good read. Um, so what I want to say is I, I try to cut a long story short for you. So I will try to keep within the 30 minutes, which uh, Sean uh, suggested as let's say an ideal time frame for sharing a bit of information about the book. And in fact, yes, I have prepared a couple of PowerPoints for that purpose. So I hope you can all see this. Oh. Try again. Just go back a bit. Sorry for that. So um, this should be the first sheet of the presentation. Um, so the book has been published in the Kluver Information Law series. Here is the book. Um, and what I want to take as a starting point for today's discussion is actually um, what is also the starting point of the discussion in the book. And that's a, you could say, functional approach to copyright law. Um, as I see it and I describe it in the book, uh, copyright law is a cyclic innovation system. So we grant copyright protection for the author who is able um, to create a literary and artistic work, but we know, and there have been lots of studies, um, that this is not just a new work in the sense of not based on pre-existing material. So basically the author is somebody who uses um, the public domain of cultural expression as source material as a basis to stand on the shoulders of giants and create a new work. And then for this achievement, we grant copyright protection, but the grant is only for a limited period of time. And then after this, the copyrighted work itself enriches the public domain. So we want to see what we could say, uh, what we could call cyclic cultural innovation, um, the work of the first author serving as a basis for second authors for derivative works. 
And we have quite important features to enable this uh, cyclic innovation process in copyright law. I have mentioned uh, the limited term of protection already. It's quite a long term, but it's a limited term. So there comes an end to copyright protection. But also during the term of protection, we ensure that follow on innovation is possible um, by exempting certain forms of transformative use. Um, you have the fair use doctrine in the US. In a European context, we have more specific limitations for these purposes. And then it's about quotations, parodies, so types of uses where pre existing material is transformed and presented in a new context, in a new setting. So that's basically um, what copyright law is about, you could say. And that's also a major concern in the copyright debate. Um, we have seen that in the past, uh, concerns about this copyright balance, about this ongoing process, um, have often led to heated debates. Um, so in the WIPO Internet Treaties, where we got as new protection elements and copyright, we got the protection of technological measures, the protection of rights management information. It was said that very often now we are exposed to technology basically framing and reshaping the copyright balance. And then when combine this with the impact of contracts, and there we had the discussion on shrink web licenses, click web licenses, then you basically give away lots of the policies of copyright law and you leave it to private market parties to shape the balance and perhaps artificially extend the term of protection or um, uh, basically abolish um, the practical um, invocation, practical use of exceptions and limitations. So this is something that we have all observed and, and um, that we have um, discussed extensively in copyright law, um, but there is a development that took place in parallel. And this, um, from my perspective, um, has been largely overlooked. And this is developments in trademark law and practice. Um, perhaps this is because we have a bit of a hyper specialization in intellectual property law. So if you are a copyright person, then you focus of on what's going on in copyright law, and you may overlook developments in other areas of intellectual property. So um, there's a bit of um, trademark law and practice um, as, as a bit of a submarine um, development um, that took place in parallel. And then uh, if I want to describe this, um, then it's basically a development where more and more contemporary cultural creations um, do no longer enjoy only copyright protection, but also trademark protection on top of that. It has become a standard um, protection strategy for character merchandising and so on to ask not only for copyright protection, but also to register um, cultural productions um, as trademarks. And we have more than enough examples of this. So in the area of fictional characters, um, of course, Mickey Mouse is not only um, a famous fictional character, but also a famous trademark. Um, uh, Donald Duck is also on the trademark register. Um, the US uh, superheroes uh, are on the trademark register. Spider-Man, Superman, um, the Peanuts are on the trademark register. Uh, we have Gargamel and the Smurfs on the trademark register. Um, there are more historic examples of this. Um, so the tale of Peter Rabbit is not only a tale in itself, it's also a tale of um, seeking trademark protection. And of course, um, on the other side of the Atlantic um, in, in Europe, it's not different in any way. Um, Asterix and Obelix are on the trademark register. Uh, Lucky Luke and the Daltons. I, I could continue like this. Um, so just one final example. Um, I don't know about the market share of uh, Miffy in the US, but uh, I mean, Miffy or Nintje, as you would say in Dutch, is a very famous fictional character in the small little country where I am based. Um, so that's the fictional characters. Um, more recently, we also see more and more cases coming up that concern uh, what we would call the classical artworks. So uh, the Scream is registered um, as a trademark. Um, we have um, registrations of uh, Vermeer's Milkmaid as a trademark. Um, colleagues from France have told me 
um, that actually Nestlé managed to really establish this as a well-known trademark in France uh, for dairy products. So here you see uh, Vermeer's Milkmaid in um, a commercial context. On the EU trademark register, um, we have the Nightwatch uh, registered uh, for, it's, it's quite exotic actually, it's registered for selling the chemical element strontium. So I guess this was also a bit of a, a proof case in order to find out whether a trademark registration would be possible. Um, and then um, when you look into um, related indications, book titles and so on, you find even more on the trademark registers. Um, so here you have the original Dutch titles of uh, Anne Frank's um, famous writings. Um, they are registered at the EU level as trademarks. Um, here you have um, uh, several other uh, European Union trademarks and you see it's, it's names of artists like Vincent van Gogh, um, also of paintings, Mona Lisa and so on, Giuseppe Verdi, Shakespeare, Leonardo da Vinci, Andy Warhol, they, they, they are all on the trademark register. And of course, the fictional names um, are also on the trademark register. So whether it's Darth Vader or Harry Potter or Pocahontas, Sherlock Holmes, Snow White and so on. So it's, you could say, a mass phenomenon to have trademark registrations relating to cultural productions. There are um, also statements in the artistic community um, that point out that um, this has become a well-established avenue for protection. So here we have a, a famous Banksy graffiti. If I'm not mistaken, we find this graffiti in Barcelona. Um, and Banksy himself, I mean, he's anonymous, perhaps it's a she, we, we don't know. Um, he said, well, copyright is for losers. I mean, that's that's, perhaps a very personal statement if you are a graffiti artist and you are anonymous and uh, perhaps what you do strictly speaking is illegal because it's other people's property that you are using for your art, um, then copyright is perhaps just not available. So you have to basically rely on something else. Um, but we see that um, uh, this intersection between copyright and trademark really has become a standard thing. It's all over the place. And that's the starting point for the book. Um, the book basically asks the question, are we doing the right thing? Um, is, is it really as relaxed as we always thought it would be? Um, so the problem statement basically is that I'm really afraid that we are drying out the sources of future creativity. I think we are living in an age that is um, as greedy as, as no age before us. Um, we have always ensured that literary and artistic works enter the public domain, but now we have reached a stage where it has become a mass phenomenon to keep at least trademark rights. So these works, these um, references to cultural works do not fall into the public domain completely. Um, I know that um, this point of view can be particularly difficult to sell um, to US audiences. So this is why um, I, was, I was particularly happy also to have this opportunity to speak about this um, in, a, in a US uh, context. Um, so from US colleagues, I regularly hear the question, what's wrong with a culture commerce amalgam? What, what, what are you afraid about at all? I mean, um, during the book launch, um, Barton Beebe, for instance, um, mentioned the example of United Airlines using the Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blues and in, in Blue and, and was asking, okay, um, he was saying that there has been hardly any cultural production in the US, which has not at the same time been developed as a commercial product or, or at least something that has commercial value at all. So here you see one advertising where um, uh, the Rhapsody in Blue is performed in an aircraft. Um, so what's wrong? Um, my answer to that is, well, perhaps um, you have become used to this amalgam of culture and commerce, but still from the perspective of how these protection systems are supposed to function, 
um, it is really wrong. So once again, my starting point is to say copyright law is a cyclic innovation system. The author takes something from the public domain, um, creates a new work, enjoys protection for a limited period of time, and then the work becomes ex completely free for follow-on innovation. Um, trademark law is really the opposite of this. So trademark law is about taking a distinctive sign out of the public domain, but then you keep that sign. You keep it as long as you use it in trade. So um, this would be my graphical representation of um, how trademark law is configured. There is no recognition of any value um, that signs uh, should become freely available again. So the clash between the two systems is obvious. So this is um, what we get when we allow conglomerates of copyright and trademark protection. And um, interestingly, what trademark law adds to your rights portfolio is exactly what copyright law wants to keep free in order to allow cultural follow-on innovation. So um, if you get trademark protection on top of copyright protection, first of all, you get a term of protection that is indefinitely renewable. And I have said earlier that the limited term of protection in copyright law, as long as it may be, but the limitation that is put on the term of protection serves the purpose of finally freeing these works and making them available for um, further literary and artistic creativity. And then it's the same you can say about um, the exceptions and limitations. So if we agree that in copyright law, um, provisions like an exemption of parody, exemption of quotation is very important because it serves the purpose of allowing cultural follow-on innovation, then um, trademark protection on top of copyright can be a way of eroding these copyright use privileges. So here um, you have a biting mythy parody. Um, as I said earlier, um, the Dutch name of Miffy is Nintje. And then you see, I mean, this is the wordplay that was made here. So um, it is the naive children's world and type of painting which uh, Dick Brunner, uh, the painter of Miffy, is uh, using himself. But then it says 9 11. So here we see Nintje as a 9 11 terrorist, really a dark. Um, uh, black parody, you could say. And this terrorist parody had to fight a war on two fronts. This was not only a copyright case, this was also a trademark case. Um, I'm not saying that the courts are getting this wrong all the time. In fact, the court finally said, um, this is a permissible use, but there were two hurdles, two obstacles, which the parodist had to surmount. So things are getting more complicated here. Um, with regard to cultural heritage grabbing, in this famous case, this was an attempt by the city of Oslo, a public body, to register no less than 100 artworks of the famous Norwegian sculptor uh, Gustav Wigeland as trademarks. And here uh, the EFTA court, which is the highest court of uh, the countries belonging to the European Free Trade, area said this this is basically an instance of commercial greed out of commercial greed a public body wants to register all these artworks in order to monopolize them for the purposes of city branding in this case so a very strong statement against this practice so um there is more to say um about this uh, from a theoretical perspective um the problem statement i would say is that um our understanding of what trademark law does is incomplete. Um, we don't understand clearly enough, and perhaps the book contributes to a better understanding of this, that trademark law is not only about market transparency and about protecting consumers against confusion. This is the, the standard story that is told. We need trademark protection in order to protect consumers against confusion. And of course, this is something nobody can be against protecting consumers against confusion. That's, that's, that's a very good um, policy basis, of course. But we must understand that the moment that we allow trademark protection, um, we also give a certain incentive. The dark side is an encouragement of investment 
in the transformation of cultural science into brands. The moment cultural science can be registered as trademarks, um, we provide incentives to the industry to invest in these kinds of trademarks. Um, and the risks are an impediment of the cultural inspiration cycle. So um, an artificial extension of protection that can have a deterrent effect. Um, intentionally or unintentionally, the trademark owner will take steps against those users who do not use the trademarked cultural sign in the sense that the trademark owner would like to see. Um, so there will be cease and desist letters. There will be artists being exposed to um, allegations of trademark infringement. And if there was no such thing as a trademark right, these allegations would simply be unfounded from the very beginning. And there is perhaps an even more fundamental risk here. Um, this is with regard to the loss of sources of inspiration. Um, we must also understand that trademark rights give the trademark owner quite strong definition power. Definition power in the sense of impregnating a cultural sign with certain commercial meanings. And these commercial meanings may interrupt the dialogue in the artistic domain. So let me explain um, this point in a bit more detail. Um, this point of communication and definition power is in fact a crucial one. Um, during the writing process, I have heard several times, yeah, but you know, cultural works are used so often in advertising and perhaps it's even a good thing um, that people learn about certain cultural works through commercial communication. Uh, sometimes people get aware of a certain cultural production, certain work uh, because of use and advertising. So why are you against this? And well, my answer is um, it's not only advertising. The moment we register cultural science as trademarks, we give the trademark owner a much more powerful position in the whole communication process. The grant of an exclusive right a trademark right gives the trademark owner a solid basis for preventing others from speaking or threatening others that they will be prevented from speaking. So um, this is particularly serious because when it comes to cultural follow-on innovation, the other party that is exposed to these uh, threats, allegations of infringement are artists. And we know from lots and lots of anecdotal evidence, also empirical studies that artists are particularly vulnerable because they are risk averse. Um, Pat Aufterheide, for instance, has pointed out several times that artists when receiving a cease and desist letter, for instance, are likely to stop. So very often an allegation of infringement may already put an end to further use in the cultural domain. So the discourse surrounding a cultural sign is no longer as free as it was before. And then if you like, um, I can add lots and lots of theory, um, European-based theory, I must admit, um, to really make this point a bit stronger. So um, we have uh, the sociological analysis of processes of um, production in the literary and artistic field conducted by Pierre Bourdieu. And he points out that literary and artistic works are not substitutable, at least not for an artist who wants to use it for follow-on innovation. As consumers, we may not care so much. I mean, as consumers, if let's say the Star Wars movie is not available, then perhaps we go and watch Guardians of the Galaxy and we still have a great evening. And so from a consumption perspective, perhaps cultural works are substitutable. From a production perspective, from the perspective of an individual artist, it matters whether the Mona Lisa, whether the Nightwatch is freely available and whether the Nightwatch is impregnated with certain cultural meanings or certain commercial meanings. It matters whether um, a quotation of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue would be understood as a reference to United Airlines in your composition or not. So this may prevent you as an artist from using this particular work as a reference material from the very beginning. And then, of course, we have aesthetic theory, we have uh, philosophical thoughts in that area. Uh, Friedrich Schiller, after 
um, the French Revolution had finally led to a totalitarian system in France, wondered how this could have gone wrong. And he said, well, the reason why this went wrong was that people were not educated. People had not been prepared for the power vacuum that had arisen. Um, and then he says, art could have made the difference. Art could have educated people, could have shown people visions of a better society so that the moment the power vacuum arises, people know what to do and how to establish um, an enlightened state. Um, similar things were said after the Second World War, uh, looking back at the terrible Holocaust and so on by Theodore Adorno. And we have more recent statements in the analysis of contemporary art. Here I have the example of Peter Osborne's book, uh, Philosophy of Contemporary Art. And he also says that it is still a central function of true artworks to, how he calls it, puncture our horizon of expectation and really um, show alternative visions of better or different social and political circumstances. So what we are doing here by allowing uh, trademark protection for cultural science is, and also submerging the cultural meaning of these science is that we are also putting at risk the spectrum of alternative visions of society that we have freely available for our discourse. The moment Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue is a commercial jingle of United Airlines, it loses the power to change social and political conditions. So that's basically um, the argument. And I think this argument um, is still very relevant also in a US context. Um, sometimes I hear US colleagues saying, yeah, but you know, um, after Tum and Brunetti, there is hardly any room in US law um, not to register these signs, at least not on grounds of um, public order morality and so on. I'm not so sure about it. I mean, I don't have the last word on this because I'm not a US trademark specialist or US trademark scholar, but the focus from my understanding in Tom and Brunetti was very much on the speech interests of the trademark applicant. But the Supreme Court said nothing about the detriment which a trademark registration may cause to other speakers. And in the case of cultural science, this detriment is self-evident, I would say. By granting a trademark right to a cultural sign, you disadvantage, you discriminate against the other speakers who do not have this trademark right. So um, if I've convinced you that there is perhaps a bit of a problem and an issue, um, if not, perhaps you like to listen just out of curiosity. Um, so um, I can tell you in the last 10 minutes a bit about solutions that uh, I develop in the book. Um, I think we can tackle this problem at different levels. Um, at the registration stage, uh, we can cultivate uh, grounds for refusal like public order and morality in order to exclude registrations from the very beginning. And then at the infringement stage, we can also do um, quite some, can also take quite some steps um, to make it easier for artists to survive these allegations of infringement. Um, so we can develop a robust gatekeeper requirement of use as a trademark, and of course also um, robust defenses, fair use defenses. So let's look at these um, remedies in a bit more detail. Um, safeguards against registration. Well, there is one um, traditional answer um, that we find in many court decisions, office decisions, and that seems to be generally accepted in um, the trademark arena. Um, as an example, I have here the Mona Lisa decision of the Federal Patent Court of Germany back in 1997. Um, the court had to deal with an attempt to register the Mona Lisa as a trademark and the court said, no, you can't have this trademark right. First of all, um, the Mona Lisa is not distinctive. And secondly, um, the Mona Lisa has become customary in trade practices, is, is used so often in advertising that consumers simply don't perceive the Mona Lisa as a reference to just one individual commercial source. So um, the requisite distinctiveness for trademark protection is missing. So one reaction to this decision is to say, um, you see, there's no problem. They can solve it. Um, another reaction to this is, this is quite cynical. 
Uh, basically, the court is saying, um, with regard to the Mona Lisa, the situation is already so bad. So the Mona Lisa has become so widespread in advertising, in commercial communication, that we can't we can't register it as a trademark any longer. And then um, when you consider alternative scenarios, so um, here you have Picasso Scanica painting a very strong statement against uh, war, civil war in particular. And now let's say, a trademark applicant wants to register Guernica for weapons, huh? or let's say, to put it more mildly, uh, registering Guernica for selling defense technology. Um, it is distinctive. It is not customary and trade practices. At least I'm not aware of widespread use of Guernica for any type of product. I don't see Guernica very often being used in advertising. So I don't see how trademark um, offices and courts um, could refuse the registration of Guernica for weapons. Um, I'm originally from uh, the region of Hessen, the state of Hessen in, in Germany, and we have this one beer producer who has consistently used Solveig song for uh, selling beer um, for years and years. So when I hear Licher beer, I think of Solveig song. So to me, this is perfectly distinctive. Solveig's song um, is not often used in advertising, at least not to my knowledge. So again, I don't see how these barriers, distinctiveness, um, generic character and so on, how this is something um, which reliably could prevent the acquisition of trademark rights. I think the story is a different one. The story is that because these signs are pre-coined, because they are already valuable as cultural signs, they already have many, many positive connotations because of the evolution in the cultural domain. For that reason, investment in the acquisition of trademark rights through use in trade is very attractive. So I think what we invite as a business strategy is free riding on positive cultural connotations. So the moment you manage to establish secondary meaning with regard to a cultural sign, you acquire a very powerful marketing tool that has lots of positive cultural connotations that you get for free. And so I think this whole practice of regulating this and on the basis of distinctive character is just a very doubtful practice. Um, the EFTA court, I think, in the decision that I mentioned earlier, I had a better solution. The EFTA court said, let's refuse these kind of um, attempts to register signs as trademarks based on public order and morality. And we see that uh, with this, with these guidelines by the EFTA court, the Norwegian intellectual property office in the Vigeland case um, was able to develop much stronger lines of arguments by saying these sculptures have so much cultural value to Norwegian society, they must be kept free. Um, and there is also a fundamental societal interest in the temporal limitations of the copyright protection. So the public domain principle in copyright law has societal value of its own. And the Norwegian Intellectual Property Office also said, what we see here is basically free riding on the reputation of cultural science, and this is something um, which we cannot permit. It cannot be that a trademark applicant um, gets the extra value of positive cultural connotations for free without having invested in the sign himself. So I think um, that would be one solution in the area of registration. With regard to infringement claims, um, so um, of course uh, we have the powerful statement in the DASTA case in the US, uh, where the court was saying that um, um, allowing trademark protection would be like allowing a cause of action um, that would create a species of mutant copyright law that limits the public's federal right to copy and to use expired copyrights. Um, but in trademark circles, at least this mutant copyrights uh, argument um, is not so much accepted, I would say. Is this argument valid? Well, you hear time and again that trademark protection is not copyright protection. 
because the infringement criteria are different. The confusion test is much more context specific than a general right of reproduction, communication to the public as you would get it in copyright law. So the question is, does trademark law really grant a general right in gross comparable to what you get in copyright? And then perhaps in the area of likelihood of confusion, there is a point, there's a bit of a point there. So here we have the example of um, um, an artist in the Benelux, uh, Cedric, and he is painting this um, uh, Dom uh, Perignon bottle, which is um, a shape trademark uh, that enjoys protection in the Benelux. And then of course the question is, is this confusing at all? Um, because quite clearly when you see the artwork, um, perhaps the link um, to uh, Moet, Hennessy and uh, the Dom Perignon producers is not that obvious. But we have other decisions like in Adidas Marca where the Court of Justice said, well, this all depends on the degree of distinctiveness. Um, the judges leave these issues again to the marketing efforts of brand owners. In Adidas Marca, the Court of Justice in the European Union said the public's perception that a sign is a decoration cannot constitute a restriction on protection against confusion when despite the decorative nature, that sign is so similar to the registered trademark that the relevant public is likely to perceive that the goods come from the same undertaking or an economically linked undertaking. So there is the pain in this economically linked undertaking. In US terminology, you could say um, confusion as to affiliation and sponsorship. Um, and then, of course, you get all the doubts, like, has Dom Perignon, Moet Hennessy, have they sponsored this artist? Um, another case, the German Supreme Court in the Medusa case, which was about the Versace uh, Medusa had said, well, this was about floor tiles. In that market, there was only 5% five, five trademark recognition, so that was not a, a case with trademark relevance, but if there had been stronger um, a trademark recognition, a higher percentage might have offered a basis for a confusion claim. And then of course, we must not overlook the remarkable development of trademark law. It's not only about confusion nowadays, we have the dilution claims as well. Um, in modern trademark law, we recognize brands, trademarked elements of the brand experience as products in their own right and those enjoy protection against um, damaging the brand value, taking advantage of the brand value. Um, and there are lots of cases about this. Uh, you have the, the, the Barbie girl case with uh, the Danish band Aqua making fun of uh, the Barbie stereotype, um, which was not only a confusion case, it was also a dilution case. Um, this was um, a case about blurring tarnishment and free riding. So that was the trademark argument here. And also this uh, case, Cedric um, painting this Dom Perignon bottle had to argue the case based on, uh, to defend himself against allegations of dilution, blurring tarnishment and free riding. So um, what can we do here? Um, in the book, I say we can learn a lot in Europe uh, from the United States, um, because in the United States, you saw the evolution of the Rogers test in um, case law, um, which means a requirement of explicitly misleading or explicitly damaging use. So I would say this is a criterion um, that would make it much harder for trademark owners to establish prima facie infringement. So we should have an infringement test that asks whether an artist is really aiming at misleading consumers, aiming at damaging the brand. Um, and then we have a threshold criterion uh, that is much more effective than um, the vague uh, use as a mark requirements that we have in EU trademark law at the moment. So, um, no worries, I come to an end. Um, I know that I'm um, close to the 30, 35 minutes. minutes. Um, let me just conclude by saying, um, from my perspective, there's lots of work to be done. I'm not saying that these cases cannot be solved under existing trademark law, um, but I'm saying that we should upgrade 
the checks and balances in trademark law. I think that we could do better. We could establish a better framework in trademark law to prevent these overlapping uh, types of protection or at least counterbalance uh, infringement claims. So instead of the unreliable distinctiveness test, uh, we should use public order and morality as grounds for refusal. Instead of a vague um, test of use as a mark in EU law, uh, we should have an extended version of the Rogers test that does not only apply to confusion cases, but also to dilution cases. And then a final word on the limitation infrastructure. I mentioned limitations like parody, quotation, and so on in copyright law that are very important to artistic processes of creation. Um, unfortunately, we do not have exactly the same exceptions and limitations in trademark law. So um, we should move from an incongruent copyright trademark infrastructure to a congruent copyright trademark infrastructure. We can either declare the copyright um, exceptions directly applicable also in trademark law, um, or perhaps use other solutions. But just to give you an example how diverse this is. So this is the limitations infrastructure we have in the EU in the area of copyright, no general fair use provision, specific defenses for quotation parody, requirement of compliance with the three-step test, and the burden of proof is on the defendant, of course, on the artist. In trademark law, we have a due cost defense, which is a fair use type of defense, but only covers dilution cases. Then we have specific defenses, but no such thing as quotation and parody. We would have to rely on referential use or non-distinctive use defenses. Then there is a requirement of compliance with honest practices in industrial and commercial matters. So please tell me how artists should know about honest practices in industrial and commercial matters. They are not in the industrial and commercial domain. And of course, as a general problem, the burden of proof in all these cases is on the defendant. So um, I think there's really lots and lots of work to, de to be done here. And perhaps the book can contribute to um, getting this whole process uh, going, or at least having a good discussion about um, what we could do in trademark law um, to prevent the corrosive effect that I fear um, will be flowing from copyright trademark overlaps. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to share as a starting point for the discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful lecture, a uh, summary of a wonderful book. Let me turn it first over to Christine, uh, but then we invite uh, others to join the queue. Um, Jerry, I'm, I'm hoping you might join the queue with us. I also know that uh, Patricia Porto, I believe is here, who's writing her dissertation on, on copyright trademark interface. I hope she can join the discussion and, and everyone else as well. But let me start with Christine. And if you want to get into the queue, please uh, raise your hand using the raise hand function in the reactions. Uh, button down below. Go ahead, Chrissy. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful book, Martin, and thank you for coming to join us uh, to share it. Um, that was a, an amazing task to reduce your book to 30, 35 minutes. Um, so <laughs> very well done. Um, you know, it is just my favorite topic. I mean, every, every topic and subtopic in the book is just thrillingly interesting to me. Um, so I'm really uh, happy about this book. I've only had a chance to get through um, almost the first half. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy um, to have the chance to, to finish it. And I'm very happy um, to hear from your remarks about a continuing project there. Um, uh, I, I, I want to really encourage you to do that. Speaking as a coming from the trademark uh, side here, and, and I recognize that uh, much of the audience is, is more obsessed with uh, copyright than trademark. I'm always happy um, to highlight for copyright folks um, all the interesting stuff happening in trademark law and all the important work um, that has to be done um, for all of the reasons that you care about copyright policy. And I think this book is such a exemplar of, of making that point. So I have some 
um, uh, thoughts, some notes that I took um, when I was reading your book and, and during your presentation. Um, and I hope that they will have um, some, um, some uh, theme to them, although I, I fear that they're gonna be a bit random. So please bear with me. Um, and, and it's more or less um, thoughts that occurred to me, questions that I have. Um, so one thought question that occurred to me is um, what's fueling um, this, as you say, phenomenon? Um, you know, is it, is it just, uh, you know, more ability for rent seeking um, that's driving it? Um, is it a, is it a um, way to get around copyright duration? Uh, as so many of your examples point out, the Veblen case, I think, is a, a great example of that. But then I thought about two other possibilities. Um, one is that um, I, I really appreciate the way you talk about um, trademark policy and the theories behind trademark protection. And so uh, another possibility is, is that uh, copyright owners may view trademark law as a very good vehicle for them to um, secure the work with a stable meaning um, over time, to, to kind of put greater control on the meaning in the way that trademark tries to do. Um, also greater control on ownership um, as, as trademark tries to do. Um, and I think that that could be a, a very important implication uh, for, for future thought. And then another idea is that um, what, few, what fuels this is just um, the change, dramatic change in trademark law, as well as the dramatic change across IP in the interface space, right? When we look at um, um, some of the old cases, so a, a great case for this in the US is the 1879 Supreme Court trademark cases, um, where the Supreme Court invalidated our first federal trademark act um, as not being constitutional. That uh, case gave the court an opportunity to define what is the subject matter of copyright, what is the subject matter of trademark. And I encourage you to go and look at that opinion because the two could not be more different. Um, if you read that opinion, you would think there would never be an interface problem, right? The two, there's no overlap. They don't even come close to one another. Um, and that has really changed over time. So I think that that fuels this to, to a great extent. Um, so a, another, um, let's see, where do my notes go from here? Sorry, bear with me one minute. Um, well, I, I know what I want to say. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the implications um, of all of this. And you raised for me a very big, important question, um, which is why we have to rely so much on channeling doctrines. You know, why, why is there so much work, so much work needs to be done policy-wise and idea expression dichotomy, functionality doctrines, these kinds of things. And why don't we have instead a, you know, choose your protection system. Um, you get one bite at the apple, you don't get several, right? Um, so it, it, it really would, I'm imagining like a forfeiture doctrine, right? You for, having chosen copyright, you forfeit your ability to get a second uh, type of protection. However, you know, if you've chosen copyright and you failed, you were denied a copyright, go ahead and try another, a, another system. Um, but, but why is it that we permit um, this, you know, oh, all of these overlapping rights. My guess is that it, it's just what I what I said before. As these doctrines developed, there wasn't the danger of overlapping rights um, that exists today. So, so a question to you is: um, Do we really want to restrict ourselves to advocating for kind of more pressure on some of the doctrines that you mentioned and on these channeling doctrines? Or, or wouldn't it be, um, you know, an interesting project to, to kind of push for um, a forfeiture doctrine? You know, you, you have forfeited the ability um, to look elsewhere for your rights. Um, okay. Um, and, and I want to just emphasize um, in, in relation to that point that in trademark law, when trademark is the second set of rights that you secure, either because either after you have secured a copyright 
or secured a patent, because of the doctrine of distinctiveness, one of the reasons you get a trademark right is because of the fact that you've already enjoyed exclusionary rights. So it is the fact of these overlapping rights that, that, that is um, your basis um, for establishing trademark rights. And that to me seems uh, just fundamentally wrong. Um, now, when you, when you talk about the, your solutions and, and having um, some of these doctrines do more work, um, I, I think this is great. And I'm, I'm thinking about, um, uh, in particular, trademark fair use. You mentioned the Rogers uh, doctrine, which of course has a lot of uh, pushback in the United States. Um, but, um, but fair use uh, needs to grow and be stronger in, in trademark law for sure, but it doesn't have to model itself on copyright fair use. It, there may be a very different way to think about uh, trademark fair use, and I think this is work to be done because it hasn't been thought through very carefully, especially by scholars. Um, for instance, there's no reason um, to uh, prevent someone from making a satire of a trademark work, right? Um, if we allow trademark fair use because um, trademarks are the way we communicate, um, then um, we, we have to communicate um, satirically through trademarks. So I, 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 I think that they don't need to develop along the same lines. And in the way that trademark fair use can be more robust, it needs to really think outside the box. Um, another doctrine um, which I think could be analyzed here is uh, trademark abandonment. Um, I, I, you know, trademark abandonment is, is hard. Um, it's a very high hurdle. It has become a, a steeper hurdle um, over the years. And this overlap, I think, contributes to our inability um, to find abandonment in trademarks. And it is the only way that we have uh, you know, any uh, end of rights in trademark law. And so I think that would, I, I would, I would um, point out that doctrine as, as one that needs to be looked at. Now let's see if there's any. Um, uh, you mentioned the chilling effects and I think that it would be very interesting to see whether people receiving cease and desist letters are chilled more when more rights are, are mentioned, right? We not only have a copyright in this, we also have a trademark in this. I wonder also whether those cease and desist letters, this of course is the great unknown, we don't know what's out there and we don't know how people are reacting to it. Um, but I wonder whether um, the, the prospect of, of uh, determining damages in yet another way under another legal regime um, also contributes to chilling effects. And then, um, Um, two, two, more, two more ideas, questions for further work is, um, in terms of a copyright trademark interface, it seems like a lot of the thought that you have put into this book is really um, focused on copyright. Um, but, but, I'm, but I'm interested in, in flipping that and, and looking the other way around. So, um, you know, you, you mentioned, I, I, I think chapter four is a fantastic chapter in which you're thinking about uh, trademark theory and how it relates to copyright theory. Um, and it all sounds good, right? Trademark theory sounds good. It's about transparency. It's about stability in the marketplace. It's about um, protecting consumers, except it really isn't about any of that, right? So um, I think more work needs to be done on really scrutinizing what it is that trademark law is doing. And I think um, your work here really helps to undermine that. Um, and so um, there, there could be also positive implications um, for, for shedding light on, on um, this, as you say, phenomenon. And that's, I'll, 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 leave, I'll leave it there for others to jump in. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in again after, at the end of the queue. Well, um, Christine, th thank you so much. I mean, um, I must say, first of all, I'm, I'm so grateful because it, it shows once again that um, uh, this book, and this is how it was, uh, what is what meant to do, is the starting point of a conversation. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the end of a conversation. It's, it's highlighting, I hope, a couple of issues that 
have been in the background for too long. So um, if we really get more focus on these issues, I mean, basically what, what you explained would justify a whole workshop, if not a whole conference. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the mapping of issues. Um, let me just make a, a couple of brief comments in, in, in reaction to, to what you just said. First of all, this whole thing about yeah, you know, these fields of protection are for very different purposes and also protection um, under copyright law is really protection of Mickey Mouse as such, as a drawing, whereas protection as a trademark is only uh, protection uh, of Mickey Mouse as an identifier of commercial source. I think this is, this is a story that um, is still very often to be heard also in court decisions. I don't believe that story any longer because I think in trademark law, we have reached a stage of development also with protection against dilution and so on, that this is just no longer entirely true, at least not in cases where um, we have a somewhat stronger source identifier. Um, then your questions about channeling doctrines. Um, in the book, I have tried to formulate an answer to this, but it's it's in the final chapter 10 where I say, well, perhaps we should we should try and think no longer about uh, policing doctrines where we correct within the legal system after the, the overlap has taken place, but perhaps we should just um, think of measures that make it undesirable for rights owners to have an overlap at all. So what I'm saying is we should move from a situation where double protection means the best of both worlds. So you can do cherry picking and instead you should have only protection of the smallest common denominator. I think basically there should be an obligation of IP owners having IP protection under different systems to ensure that both systems remain fully operable and can fulfill their societal functions to the fullest. So this means that we would diminish the directly available protection to such an extent that ideally intellectual property owners are no longer asking for double protection, but start focusing on the one system that they find really important. And with regard to for feature, I have said that, well, perhaps one starting point could be to say in the case of uh, logos that have been designed to serve as a trademark, but that attract copyright protection accidentally to then say, okay, you can register this as a trademark, but you also um, sign a declaration uh, that you will not use that trademark in a cultural context to impede cultural productions, which would mean you can have the trademark, right? But you make a declaration that you don't use it in a cultural context. Um, which brings me to the final point, flipping the whole thing around. Um, yeah, it was, Actually, when I started the whole project, I thought I could write a book about all types of protection overlaps. And um, after 600 pages on this particular overlap, I thought, okay, I stop here because this, this, this will keep me busy for the rest of my life. If I flip it around, and if I, if I say it's not about the copyright trademark overlap, but about the trademark copyright overlap, of course, I mean, copyright erodes um, the principle of specialty. If you design a logo, you register it as a trademark and you register it only for, let's say, uh, selling cars and you have copyright on top, then this limitation to only cars is gone. And there are lots and lots of other examples where copyright for those creations that are really meant to serve as trademarks does exactly the same horrible things to the trademark balance, which the other way round, when you register a cultural sign as a trademark, um, which happened then to this cultural sign. So um, I fully agree that, um, yeah, once again, I mean, there's lots and lots of work to be done there. So thanks so much for these comments. So we now can um, open it up for anyone. I had seen, um, I think it was David was in the queue for a moment, but I'm not sure he's still there. But anyone who wants to make a comment or ask a question, you're most welcome. Uh, Jim Tupin, I saw you asked a comment in the in the text that I don't know if you want to uh, raise explicitly, if it's still on your mind, and then we can take Alex next. Jim, do you want to ask? Yeah, that sure. I mean, it yeah. seemed to me listening to the talk that there was a distinction to be made between 
cultural symbols that were already cultural symbols and pre-existing in the public domain that somebody then wanted to appropriate for trademark use, as opposed to symbols like the Mickey Mouse ears or James Bond, where they weren't previously cultural symbols. And the fact that they became cultural symbols were completely or in part a function of the use of the trademark investment incentive. Um, and whether there shouldn't be a distinction between those kinds of uh, overlaps. Um, and uh, I, I thought you did started to develop such a distinction in your talk. And then as I listened to your uh, exchange with Professor Farley, that distinction seemed to go away. Martin, let me take a couple. Um, but so Alex, yes. do you still wanna ask a question? Alexander? And then I'll yeah, take just Patricia. Very... Yes. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, that was a very great presentation. Very, very interesting to follow for me. Um, I should put a disclaimer. I'm, I'm, I'm an economist working at WIPO. So this is particularly interesting. And we released a study the other day looking into overlapping rights as well. So that's really interesting. Um, so I'm having a hard time at the same time to follow actually uh, legal discussions to some extent, to be honest. But as much as I can follow them, uh, maybe just three observations I had. Um, the first one was, I'm not sure I'm buying the assumption that everything in the copyright that goes into the copyright system is kind of this follow on innovation, the cyclical aspect. So as an empirical researcher, um, I would have the ambition to actually measure how much of, of, of the new supplies we're getting under the copyright system are actually follow on innovations. I, I, I like the idea of, of having a of look, looking at the system from a dynamic perspective, but I think it would need measurement and assessment how much it's really follow on innovation. Um, that's the first observation. The second one is, um, uh, the second one is, um, I, you mentioned free riding uh, at some stage. And I think um, I could imagine a trademark owner with, an, with, an, with a trademark that overlaps um, that actually invested quite a lot of money into building up that copyrighted uh, character as an example. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a bit with, with saying everyone is free writing, right? But maybe it's a, it's a terminology issue here. And, and, and finally, the third observation I wanted to make, um, yeah. uh, no, I don't, I don't recall it. If I uh, recall it, I, I, I write you a message. Thank you. You can, you can come back into the, into the, uh, the conversation too. And, and Jim, Jim Tupin Martin is the former Solicitor General for the USPTO and, and is, and is a, a, you know, a, tra a long time trademark expert, you know, especially at the, at the PTO. He was especially on the T side of the PTO. And Alex, as he introduced, is, is at WIPO and the economics division. And Patricia is from Brazil and she's actually doing her thesis or maybe has completed it, a part, a pro, sorry if I've, <laughs> uh, on, on overlap, overlapping between copyright and trademark. So Patricia, thank you for joining us and please make a, a comment or question. Thank you, Professor Shan. Yes, I completed two years ago. And Professor Martin, I would like to congratulate you for the excellent work. It was a very great cont contribution for the research field. Uh, I would like to uh, stay to, to comments and it's a question also. Uh, the first one is that at least some uh, authors that discuss the teams in Brazil regarding uh, the work that is famous and is uh, already in public domain, or there is a cultural heritage from uh, some, some societies. Uh, they, we have a thesis that they are in public domain. And as in public domain, it's not in public domain from copyright field or trademark field. It's in public domain, period. So as in public domain, everybody can use and nobody can prevent it. 
because uh, so uh, a lot of them are discussed with PTO members, uh, examiner in, in Brazil PTO, to uh, uh, question that when the trademark are accepted, for example, that the milk made for Vermeer was a trademark subject in Brazil also. Uh, and when this happens, okay, he also can use, but he also can prevent in any kind of way even to argue in a confusion before, before the, the public. And this leads me to, and I would like to know what you think about this, this statement of I'm agree and other authors can, can uh, it's, it, it's saying. And the second, uh, this leads to the second uh, question or, or at least my, my observation. Uh, I think that we should put some pressure through the trademark owners also that ha have uh, the, the copyright and trademarking uh, 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 rights uh, and when in an infringement action because we know that a lot, in a lot of cases they want to do this to circumvent a very public interest rules of each system. For example, uh, 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 the public domain period, the validity of the copyright, they want to extend utilizing the trademark uh, rights. So in my perspective, I think it's a kind of abuse of intellectual property rights because they abusing, they using one fi finality of one right to circumvent the other. Or they use it without, uh, uh, they use it, for example, uh, uh, trademark, but uh, using uh, copyright limitations. Do you understand that they, they, they use one right to circumvent the others? So this is an abuse. And at the infringement actions, I never see, but I, I don't think that is, why not? We can use against also, the abuse of, of copyright in this case, when we can prove uh, uh, these, uh, these usual things that happen. So it's my, my two observation. I hope I was clear. Martin, yeah, to you, yeah, you, please. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. So um, this, this, this was quite something. Um, but I've taken notes, so uh, I hope to answer all the questions. So I start with uh, James' question about the distinction um, between cultural heritage that has always been in the public domain uh, uh, or has entered the public domain in the meantime and contemporary um, cultural creations like the fictional characters. And you're absolutely right, there is a distinction to be drawn there. In the book, um, I have a chapter that deals with uh, different types of what I would call cultural signs. And so there is one category which I call the cultural heritage signs, the Mona Lisa scenario. And Another is the contemporary cultural creations, and this would be the Mickey Mouse scenario. But you see, um, I'm not saying that Mickey Mouse is commercial from the very beginning. So from my perspective, Mickey Mouse is also a cultural creation. It might have been created as a mainstream work for sale on the mass market to mass audiences, but this doesn't mean that it is from the very beginning a commercial um, creation that should enjoy trademark protection. So there my conception um, is different. Why is it different? Well, because I'm saying the moment uh, that you exploit such a creation under copyright rules, you are bound to the quid pro quo in copyright law. So you have to leave it to the public domain at some point. Otherwise, you reap the fruits of the copyright protection without paying the price for this, um, which to some extent is perhaps already an answer to the final uh, points which uh, Patricia, Patricia made. Um, I agree that with regard to this distinction, um, there's also a difference to be drawn between the arguments I'm making. So for instance, my public order morality arguments, I must admit, are stronger from my perspective when we speak about cultural heritage like the Mona Lisa and so on, the Night Watch. Um, whereas in cases like Mickey Mouse, it's of course quite something to say to Disney 
um, it's against public order um, that you use Mickey Mouse for commercial purposes um, after copyright expiry. What you can say is that the public domain principle in copyright law is a principle that has public order status as a fundamental concern of society for cultural follow-on innovation. So um, you see, I'm, I'm navigating between these different types. Um, there was just not enough time for explaining these um, nuances um, during this, this book talk uh, today. Um, yeah, and, and with regard to uh, the economic analysis, um, Alexander, thanks, thanks so much. I remember our discussion um, at WIPO um, in the good old days before the, the pandemic. So uh, I already had a bit of a preview. Um, first of all, I, I fully agree that um, um, there is lots and lots of work to be done here in terms of economic analysis, uh, also empirical analysis. Um, um, what I can say is that at least this follow on innovation thing is understood very broadly in an intellectual property in, in a copyright context. So it's, it's not by, let's say, directly taking over, but also putting together bits and pieces of pre existing works. Um, and um, there has been extensive work in the US, also in the EU. Uh, Giancarlo uh, Frosio, for instance, has written a wonderful book um, where he shows, uh, based on a historical analysis, is how, let's say, different uh, types of creations have always been used as uh, source material for follow-on innovation. Um, whether is it, it is possible to um, uh, say different things from an economic perspective, again, I, I, can't, I don't know. I'm not an economist myself, so I look forward to all studies that uh, place this in a somewhat um, uh, more nuanced uh, light. Uh, but for the time being, I'm still convinced that this is really a principle in copyright law and is important. Um, with regard to the free writing argument, yeah, it depends on how strong um, you, you want to develop this argument. As, for, as I see it, uh, once again, um, the moment you enjoy copyright protection and you make use of this copyright protection, you should be bound to pay the price for this. So the price for copyright protection is um, that you allow the creation to enter the public domain. And if you don't pay this price, whether you are the prior copyright owner yourself, whether you are the estate, the, the I, I don't care. I mean, sometimes I hear from people who say, yeah, but don't you think that at least um, the estate of an important author uh, should be able to get a trademark? I say, no, no, because they are bound by the copyright rules as well. So they enjoy the term of protection that is going beyond lifetime of the author, as they enjoy this, they have the fruits of um, the author's labor. And I think um, that should be enough. And I think it's free writing to try to um, continue this protection, um, even if it's in, in, in trademark fashion, uh, beyond uh, the copyright term. And then to uh, Patricia's uh, comments, I, I love this debate about the public domain status. Um, I must admit that um, in that respect, I'm not very radical. I know that there is public domain theory really putting the public domain as an absolute monolith, uh, like no rights whatsoever. Um, um, everybody can do what he or she wants. In my book, the public domain serves a purpose. The public domain is subordinate to cultural follow-on innovation. So this is where the resources for cultural follow-on innovation come from. So the public domain in my book is something um, that serves the purpose of fueling um, the continuous cultivation of the cultural landscape, you could say. Um, I know that this is not the most radical view on, on the public domain, um, but at least it allows me to say that um, we must be very careful in giving individual speakers more communication power than others. So as long as the public domain is understood like everybody can use it, and I'm not saying that use in advertising is as bad as use as a trademark, because use in advertising does not come with exclusive rights. So artists are still able to take over control and claim back um, definition power about this cultural 
sign. The moment a trademark right is granted, it's a different story because you have one individual trademark owner with more um, definition power because of an exclusive right to prohibit others from use. So, um, yeah, and, and with regard to abuse of rights, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, the only thing is that from a risk assessment perspective, I'm not so sure whether these doctrines work so well because it's quite complicated to bring this up in court to convince a judge to really accept this argument. So this is why I prefer solutions that make it impossible for the trademark owner to establish a valid prima facie infringement claim in the first place. So I would prefer solutions where the trademark owner in these cases does not even manage to convincingly establish infringement because then even if the defendant, the artist does nothing, the judge hearing the case would say, okay, you don't, you don't have a case because you don't manage to establish relevant trademark harm. So I dismiss the case, even if the defendant, the artist, um, does not react in any way. So this is why I'm a bit hesitant to say there are these doctrines like abuse of rights and so on, but I see the value in them. I just am not so sure about the practical value in the sense of reducing the chilling effect in practice. Yeah, but again, thanks, thanks so much for all comments. I mean, this is- uh... thank, thank you so much for, it's a very, very rich and knowledge for us. Thank you. Peter, I'm gonna go over to you and then this, this might be our last question in the formal session and then we'll wrap up, but then we'll, as I mentioned, we'll, um, we'll turn off the camera, um, just the recording camera, but you can leave your cameras on and go into informal session after this, but um, Peter, to you. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you, Martin. It, it's a, it was a wonderful presentation about a project that I think is of, of really urgent importance and uh, the book, which I've just begun and am loving, should, I think, stimulate a, a great deal of discussion. I want to start with an apology, which is that I'm going to say something and then I'm going to have to leave. And I may not even get a chance to, to hear your response, but I, I did want to, to add it to the discourse because there's been some discussion already about whether or not one can really document or, or observe uh, chilling effects on follow-on creativity as a result of, of the, the sort of the, the growing, what I would prescribe almost to borrow a term from patent law, trademark thicket. Um, and what I can offer from the work that I do and have done over, you know, 15 years or so uh, with with filmmakers, mainly documentary filmmakers, is that these effects are really, really profound and, and powerful. And one can see them sometimes physically or visually manifested in movies. Whenever you see, whenever you see a logo on someone's hat dissolving into pixelation or a t-shirt strangely obscured so that the, the, it, the, the original image doesn't play, appear, that's because somewhere, someone, some along the line in that production process has said, oh, well, you're, you're running too much risk if you, if you actually show someone's trademark, even though you are showing it in the context of a film that is designed to depict reality, that is designed to convey a, a, a natural and, and authentic view of a setting in which trademarks appear normally as they do is as part of our, our, our man-made visual landscape everywhere. And so the, if the question is do, I don't know if this is a relevant example of overlap or not, but I do know that it helps to speak to the question of whether people are intimidated by concerns about trademark infringement. The answer based on, you know, a limited but growing sample of, of filmmakers that I can cite is absolutely. And in some ways they are more terrified by trademarks than they are by copyrights, because at least where copyrights are concerned, they have some uh, sort of mental map of, of 
of of the the doctrine. They understand that they may have fair use rights. Where trademarks are concerned, they begin at a much more uh, primitive level in terms of information. So yes, there really is a problem. Whether whether this example, as I say, whether this example fits your thesis or not, I'm unsure. But it's really good evidence of the fact that creators do adapt to their practice in ways that are deleterious to the quality of their communications because of concerns about uh, incidental trademark infringement. And with that, I've got to go. I'm terribly sorry. We'll talk. But uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful project. Thank you for it. Martin, I'll invite you to um, give a short response, and then we'll uh, close the formal session. And, uh, and Martin Nolan will, will pick you up in the informal session, if you don't mind. But go ahead, Martin. Yeah, and then we do the partying in the informal online session. Um, right. we, we, we all open our bottles of champagne and so on. Um, oh, man, you're no, well, still I'm, morning here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, I can be brief on that one because I fully agree. Um, I must say that um, the project, as, as I have conducted it, is, is of course, uh, predominantly um, a legal doctrinal, also an interdisciplinary uh, project where I looked into um, a bit of cultural uh, theory, sociological analysis, and so on. With regard to that point of chilling effects and so on, I relied on uh, the growing and I think also quite already quite robust uh, literature and also studies that show that um, there is this risk and um, uh, the more you, you speak with artist communities, uh, the more confirmation you normally get. So I had one uh, chance uh, speaking to um, organizers of uh, cultural events in Rotterdam and um, they also confirmed that they are really afraid very much um, of allegations of trademark infringement because um, trademark owners also seem to be known for quite an aggressive uh, enforcement strategy. Uh, but to be honest, this is all, or, or much of it is anecdotal evidence. So, um, I mean, if we, if we ever manage to really have um, uh, a broad um, empirical study um, also about the cease and desist um, uh, question to which extent this directly puts an end to uh, cultural productions and so on. This would be a very, very valuable uh, basis for further research and a very important confirmation that the concerns that we have seen and discussed for so long um, are true concerns and are broadly shared. So um, I fully agree that this, like many other things, um, would be wonderful, uh, a wonderful starting point for further research. Absolutely. And I can see that the uh, Dutch, like the Germans, watch their, watch their clock closely. You've left me exactly a minute to do my quick closing and turn off the camera and, and perfectly on time. So thank you. So we've reached the end of our, our formal session for this presentation. And so I want to extend a, a hearty and full thank you to Martin for the presentation of his tome to us and for all of you for joining the conversation. You can find the recording of this and all of our other public events this year on the event page at pidgeot.org. As I mentioned, those videos are open license for reuse, for educational, or really any other purpose, and so you're welcome.